In this session of the Bevel Coffee Podcast, we talk about the importance of validating your idea before you put all that hard work into place. Hello and welcome to session 53 of the Purple Coffee Podcast, inspiring stories from some of the world's finest. I'm your host, Turndog, and on this occasion I speak to Grant Baldwin, who is a professional speaker, a bit of an educator, and he happens to have a podcast of his own, which seemingly overnight just burst onto the scene and he got great guests and he made a lot of inroads. But of course it wasn't an overnight success because Grant's been building his network and that maze of wisdom inside his head for a long time now. And Grant was very kind to jump on board, share some of his stories, share that great mistake, not just for this podcast session, but for my book, The Successful Mistake too. And Grant's a great guy to follow, especially if we want him to get into the speaking world. But he's expired beyond that these days he's doing courses as well write some great content and whatever it is that he shares in whatever format that he chooses to do so it's valuable stuff so be sure to check out Grant after you've listened to this interview of course right now you have a quick session to listen to because Grant comes at you with some very valuable advice indeed and it's all about validating your idea after Grant built his podcast and he started to get a bit of momentum was building an audience he felt like he needed to well ultimately create a course you know try and make some money off of it try and take things to the next level so he had an idea and he put a lot of hard work into it and he built it but long story short he kind of found it didn't hit all the bits but it needed to hit his audience were left yearning for more and it just goes to show the importance of validating your product if you've got an idea you've got an idea for a new product a service a project whatever it might be go out there pre-sell it get those ideas make sure that it's fulfilling a need fulfilling a want it has a true purpose and then you can go ahead and build it but not only that you will find out what those people who are buying it truly truly need so you may have a b and c idea they may help fill in the blanks of d e and f and the rest of the letters in the alphabet so it's a great talk and i'm going to get straight into it now because well you didn't come here to listen to me summarize did you now no you listened to me and grant chatting shop and such so that's what i'm going to do but before let me first share a quick bio I've done in Grant's honour, which will hopefully give you a bit more of an insight into who he is and what he does. So let's do that right now, shall we? Okay, awesome. Grant Baldwin gives you the confidence to find and do the work you love. When you think about it, this is a rather worthy cause because if everyone in the world had a job or worked on something that they love, the term Blue Monday would disappear into the ether forever. Imagine a world where everyone looked forward to Monday. I can't do it, it's too intense, my mind nearly fails me. So, how does Grant go about this worthy mission? Well, he has a rather awesome podcast to start with, and does a whole heap of speaking too. He creates courses and writes content, and goes about his task of ridding the world of Blue Mondays each day. I, for one, admire him for it, although a word without Blue Mondays may be a world without Blue Monday by New Order. That's a good song, so maybe you should stop Grant. Just saying. It's Grant and me, chatting. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for joining me. I'm delighted to have part of this incredible journey, Grant Baldwin, who has a podcast called How Did You Get Into That? It's an amazing podcast. Just check it out. I'm going to be putting his link in his podcast below this video and audio. Be sure to check it out. Some amazing guests. And it suits a guy like me because I'm all about people's stories. And wow, does Grant share some incredible stories from inspiring minds and yeah it's an amazing one so grant first of all thank you ever so much for joining me and being part of a successful mistake in this podcast wow it is a delight and an honor to hang out with a scholarly gentleman like yourself so thanks for letting <laughs> me be here matthew man i get called a lot of things often and gentleman is far far few and far between so that is very kind of you thank you and I mean, I'm going to ask you to share a little bit more about your world in a second, but before you do that, there's some cool little tidbits on Grant's About page, a few fun facts, uh -oh. some good uh -oh. ones, but the one which really stood out to me is that you've been shaving your head since the third grade. Now, I'm from England. The education mm. system is mm. a little bit different to what you have out in the Midwest, but that's like when you were eight years old, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that'd be about right. So, uh, That is commitment. I, I, 
It is. Well, it's, I don't know. I don't even know if it's commitment. I think it's just it's low maintenance. So uh, <laughs> usually once once a week or every other week, I'll do it. My mom started doing it for years and years and years, and then my wife took over doing it. And uh, yeah, it's just. It's just low maintenance. So even my, my wife, we, uh, we started dating when I was a freshman in high school. So we've been together for like 18 years or something. She's never seen me with hair. So uh, there's, very, there's very little photographic evidence of me ever having hair. So I, was, uh, yeah, I shaved it again last night. So I'm, I'm fresh for you guys, ready to roll. And uh, it's low maintenance. I don't have to mess with it. Man, I love that. I mean, yeah, it must be like the rarest picture of all. Grant Baldwin with hair. It is. It's kind of like a... Uh, uh, like the Loch Ness monster or something. It's it might be <laughs> out there, but it's just the pictures are fuzzy and grainy. You're not even sure if they're real or if they've been they've been photoshopped. <laughs> I love it. Well, for those watching and listening, you may or may not know about Gran, and he is more than just a man who shaves his head for a rather long time. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, my good man. Share a little bit about yourself, what you do on the podcast, and how you kind of got into all this. And then we're gonna talk about your great mistake and delve into the successful mystic world. Yes, yes, yes. And, and again, man, thanks for, for letting me hang out with you. It's truly an honor. Uh, so I'm uh, born and raised uh, in the U.S. here. lived here my entire life. And uh, growing up, I, I always enjoyed working with students and always enjoyed uh, speaking. So uh, after college, I was a youth pastor at a local church for a little while, uh, then started doing speaking full time. So I was doing that for about six, seven years or so. And kind of that transition between when I was at a, a local church, between when I started my business as an entrepreneur, kind of just had that identity crisis of like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because I, you know, I was doing kind of a, you know, a job that I thought I'd really enjoy, and parts of it I enjoyed, and parts of it I hated, and and I, I would guess that a lot of your audience can identify that, where you're like. Ah. I'm doing something. It's okay. It's not entirely what I want to do, but I'm not really sure what I'd rather be doing. And so, I spent a lot of time just trying to figure out what is it. What do I want to be when I grow up? You know, and trying to just really think some of that stuff through. So, uh, so started my business, started my career as a speaker, and uh, over the past seven, eight years or so, I've been traveling uh, all over, primarily around the U.S. and speaking at uh, a lot of high schools, colleges, universities, and just helping people think through and prepare for those next steps and kind of where it is that their life is headed. So, then recently, a couple months ago, we started a podcast called How Would You Get Into That, where we're interviewing people, uh, just the interesting, inspiring types of people, figuring out what it is that they do, and not only that, but how they got into that journey, and what are some things that we can learn uh, that we can replicate from, from their journey. So it's, uh, it's been fun to uh, figure this out myself, and I think that's part of the, uh, the fun of, of being able to connect with guys like yourself. We're all on this journey. We're all trying to figure out uh, what it is that, uh, that we want to do with life and how we contribute to a bigger picture of the world. Oh, indeed, indeed. It's all about trying to place your purpose on this world. And it does take a little while. And I love how you got into speaking. Um, I know a few people who do the kind of thing that you do going around colleges and high schools and stuff. And I feel if you get into that world, you're just destined at some point in your life to start that entrepreneurial journey because speaking in front of crowds just breeds confidence. And such a huge part of delving into working for yourself is just having the confidence to take that step. And I can imagine you've taken sure. so much from being a speaker and just meeting the amount of people that you have. Yeah, yeah. Being a speaker has been a lot of fun, you know, and it's it's got uh, amazing highs and, and enjoyment to it. Uh, there's nothing quite like being on a stage live in front of, uh, you know, thousands of people. We've been on uh, a keynote an event a couple years ago for 13,000 people. Uh, and just knowing that you've got that audience with you and that they're, you're, you're taking them on that journey uh, is, is a blast. There's nothing like it. So, yeah, definitely. Um, it builds like you said it breeds and builds that confidence that like man i you know i got this and this is hard work and it's not easy and nobody may see the, the preparation that i put in behind the scenes but uh there's also plenty of times where you you drop the ball where you fail and there's you know i've, I've given hundreds and hundreds of presentations and a lot of them have gone really really well but then there's some where you're like that was a disaster let's not do that again it just sucked it just fell flat it just there wasn't a connect with the audience and that happens sometimes, and I, that's not just true for just speaking. That's just that's true with entrepreneurial endeavors of any kind. Uh, that's just true with life. That sometimes yeah. things go really, really well, and sometimes sometimes they don't. Brush yourself down and move on. And I know, I mean, I've not really done a great deal of speaking as such, but I did work at a summer camp for many years in the Midwest, actually. And it is just working with children, you know, giving presentations, speaking in front of crowds. It gives you the, the confidence to do stuff. And I think if I had that lacking for my life. 
I don't think I would be where I am today because having that experience just is so valuable. So, I mean, before we get going into the big mistake and into Grant's journey, anyone watching or listening, if you can get out there and do some kind of speaking or workshopping, anything like that, you will take so much from it. It's a true valuable lesson for life. And when, think, when you when you first uh, when you first start speaking, whether you're just doing it, you know, for for uh, once or twice, or you're doing it as a career. Yeah, the first time you do it, it's it it may fall flat, it may be a disaster. That's will, okay. And I mean, the, the first time you do anything, you know, it's never going to go well. You know, the uh, you know Apple just recently released their new iPhone six. You know, well, six is going to be better than version one, but version one is what they had at the time, whenever it first came out. And so each time you just get better. The first time I gave a speech, it was horrible, and that footage is buried deep in the archives of the interwebs. <laughs> but now I've done it enough that y- you get good at it. So even if the first time you 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 get kicked off the horse or it's just a disaster, uh, jump back on and, and, and try again. It's, it's worth it. And in essence, that is the true nature of the successful mistake, the whole idea that we are going to make mistakes. And it's how you react to them, adapt to them, and transform them into something better. And they are quite scary in the beginning, but after a while you start thinking, well, you know, this mistake is just going to breed into something better. And totally. As long as I have the right mindset, it's all going to be good. As long as it do- yep. whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's the the saying, right? That is. That is. That's I don't it. remember who. Uh, it's like I don't remember who sings. So it's in some song, but I yeah, don't I don't. I have no idea where that kind of started, but I'm sure I've heard it many times before. So Grant, I've got to say I'm really excited to hear your um, your big mistake because you've been someone who's done a lot of speaking. I mean, as soon as you start doing events or live speaking engagements like you do you're always going to be at the risk of making quite incredible mistakes and having great stories because it's just the nature of the game. But also since you've set up the podcast and everything like that, it's just a fast moving world. I'm sure you've learned a great deal in the past few last few months. And man, your podcast has just boomed recently. And it's so great to see someone who's, you know, in your position and, and seeing it grow. So I'm going to pass it over to you. Share your big mistake with us, how it came about. We'll take it from there. And yeah, see where that journey's led. Yeah, I would say this. I'll give you this caveat before we jump into this. I'm someone, even when we were talking a little bit offline, I'm someone who I, I make plenty of mistakes, but uh, I, I make a lot of non fatal mistakes. You know, I think a lot of times people view mistakes as like this huge crisis, and, and even sometimes people view mistakes as, you know, you, you should make a lot of them and you learn from mistakes, and that, that's all well and good. I think I've always just take, taken the perspective of I make mistakes, but I just, I just don't dwell on them. So sometimes it's difficult for me to come up with. The, well, here's my grand mistake. Not because I haven't made them, but just because it happened. I can't change the past. I can't do anything about now. So I don't want to dwell on it. I can learn what I can and then be able to, to move on. So uh, at the same time, I would say like uh, every mistake, every good, bad thing that has happened in my life and up until this point, I wouldn't change anything about it because I think those, those things that, that, that happen to you, both good, bad, ugly, they help shape and define who you are today. So even though you, you look at something that may have been a huge mistake, Oftentimes I feel like, well, if I hadn't made that mistake, maybe it wouldn't have led to what I'm doing today. And so if, if I had gone, a, if that had gone really, really smooth, then maybe I'd be taking a totally different trajectory and plan and path than where I'm at right now. So just realizing that, that if you, if you are in the midst of a mistake or if you've made a mistake, um, check your pulse, make sure that you're alive and well and move on from it. Learn what you can, but don't, don't dwell on it. Don't beat yourself up over it because you, you can't, you can't do anything about yesterday. There's a, um, there's an old children's book here in the U S I don't know if you guys have it as well, uh, called don't cry over spilled milk. And the idea is basically, you know, like if, if you, you know, I've got a bottle of water here and if I pour it out, like there's no sense in crying over it because I I can't get it all back in the bottle. Like it's done, you know. So you clean up the mess and you move on from it. And so the the same thing is true in life whenever it comes to any any type of mistake. So with that whole preface in mind, uh, I've made a variety of mistakes. One I made recently was um, uh, I speak a lot with high school students and a lot we do a lot with helping students prepare for uh, college and university and some of those next steps. So one of the things that we were hearing a lot from parents and students was they knew they wanted to go to college, they knew they wanted to go to university, but it's it's really really expensive. So they just weren't they weren't sure how to pay for it. So we put together this course and put a lot of work into it, a lot of hours into building like this product that we like. Ah, this is perfect. This is gonna be great. Everybody's gonna love it. 
And uh, so we, we make this thing. It's, it's been you know weeks and hours putting it together. And we get ready for launch, and we uh, launch it, and it's just crickets, just nothing. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we'll make, I don't know, maybe like ten, fifteen thousand uh, of doing this launch in in one week. And I think we made like seven hundred, maybe uh, something like that. And it's just one of those you just like, oh, like I'd been talking about it, been building up to it, and people like, hey, how the launch goes? Like it was horrible, <laughs> it was a disaster, you know. And that it happens, and, and even that, I'm just like, man, that was silly. But I'm, I'm happy, actually, I'm, I'm prepping for a launch and a different product coming up in a, a few weeks. Uh, and so much of what I learned there is I'm able to apply. And so this next launch is going to go better because of the mistake and because uh, that fell apart and because we we messed up some parts of it. So again, those things they happened. You know, whether it be with a product launch or with speaking, there's been plenty of times. Um, where I've been speaking and just there's random things that happen or things that you're just not expecting. Uh, one of my first speaking engagements um, was I was speaking um, at a, a school assembly and uh, uh, it was like the Friday before spring break. So everybody's getting ready to take a break for a week or so and go away on vacation. So everybody's already checked out. You know, they don't want to be there. And it's a, uh, a Friday afternoon and they come over the, like the loudspeaker of the announcement and they say that the, the volleyball team is dismissed to go to their game or practice or something. So there's a, there's a handful of people around the audience who get up and they head out of the gym. Well, as these, as these and it's primarily a, a girls volleyball team, so as these girls are getting out, there's a few guys that start sneaking out. And before long, like there's several groups of people that are just walking out of the assembly, like in the middle of the assembly. And I'm just like, is this happening right now? <laughs> like, so there's, I'm, I don't know, there was a good number of people who are just in the middle of the assembly in this school gymnasium that are just getting up and walking out. Like, are you even allowed to do that in school? And it's just one of those moments where you're just like, ah, this sucked. But if I had based my entire speaking career on that moment, we wouldn't be talking right now. But you have those moments where you, you, you know, you, you, I leave and I get back in the car and start driving home. I was like, that was horrible. Let's, let's never have that happen again. But I wouldn't change it because it made me a better speaker. It made me a better communicator. Doing a bad launch made me a better entrepreneur and made me a better business thinker. Uh, and so those things help shape and define who you are today. So those are a few of my uh, my big mistakes that I've had. Man, I love it. And it is. I mean, you talk about it often being the you know the road, the journey without that mistake. Who knows what it could lead to? And all those little things they piece together to make up who you are and being the experienced individual that you are. I always talk about, you know, going back to childhood. If you didn't learn how to crawl, you wouldn't be able to learn how to walk. You wouldn't be able to yep. learn how to run and you wouldn't learn how to be able to be a sports. And that, and, and that might be, you know, in the end, you're like an athlete who like, makes millions of dollars a year playing football or basketball or something. But without learning how to crawl and falling over so many times, I have a young son who's just gone through that whole process of falling over, bumping his head, crying. Without that, you cannot go to the next stage. And with regards to your mistake, I just want to go back to the launch. Where do you think the mistake was was based, really? Was it, you know, did you set your expectations too high? Didn't you validate your idea? Did, um, you know, there's something else within there that kind of led to the downfall? Or was it just one of those things? Yeah, I think I think there's a few things that went into it. I think um, it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing whenever I'm speaking to students in that the... Uh, uh, the the my buyer and my uh, audience are different people. So it's typically like a school principal or it's some adult, you know, usually some forty something adult who's who's bringing me in to speak. But they're paying me to talk to their audience, the students, the sixteen and seventeen year olds. So in this case, on this product, uh, it's kind of one of those things where I'm speaking to the students because I want the students to take ownership of how they are going to pay for college. I don't want them to just push the responsibility on on mom or dad or a teacher or a counselor or something like that. I want them to take ownership. But realistically, it's probably going to be their parents that are going to be buying the product either for themselves or to kind of understand some stuff or for their child. And so when we were kind of um, uh, building the product and we were kind of like we're divided, we were talking to kind of both, you know, part of the time we talked to students, part of the time we were talking to parents. And so I think there's just confusion there of who, who is this product for? And even whenever it got ready to uh, for people to buy it, realistically, students weren't going to be the ones that would buy it. It would be their parents. And so when we're pushing it to students like, hey, you should buy this, most students aren't buying uh, 
products online, you know, and, and we made it that we priced it higher. So we probably priced it wrong and, and priced it as more of like a premium type product. So most students aren't buying some type of, of, of digital product online, let alone a pricier premium one. Uh, and so the material in the course was really, really good, but I just think how we set it up and who we were marketing and pushing to uh, and how we priced it, I think we just, we just missed the ball on those. So uh, it ended up being a, a debacle, but... Um, it's one of those things like, ah, that sucked, but we, you know, you learn from it, you move on. I know that the, like I said, the launch that we're getting ready to do, uh, I've thought a lot of those things through because of how, uh, that last one went. So we'll be better prepared next time, um, because of the lessons that we learned there. Fantastic. And I want to touch on the next launch in just a moment, but first, I mean, if you could do it all again, would you do something a little bit different? Maybe, you know, beta test it, you know, something like that, get some, you know, smaller groups to try and, you know, see what the sort of outlook is before maybe doing all your projections? I mean, what, what would you kind of do differently? Yeah, I'd say some of the things that we we are doing differently on this next launch is coming from that. So, for example, um, most of the most of the ways that people build products are that we um, we go into our cave, we create it, and then we come out, and then we um, uh, we create it, we build it, and then we sell it. And uh, we we hope that what we've created, what we've built, is what people are looking for. You know, and so I kind of went back to my cave and I built this thing, and then I brought it out to people and I said, Hey, I made this thing. And, and so I didn't even really take the time to necessarily validate it and make sure this is exactly what they are looking for. So on this next go around, uh, there's this course that we're creating right now called clarity course. And so with our podcast and what it is that we do, there's a lot of people who, uh, like we alluded to earlier, they are doing some type of job they don't like and they want to get out of it, but they don't really know what they want to go to and haven't really taken the time to figure out what, what am I good at? What am I passionate about? What do I enjoy doing? What's the market allow? And just trying to figure out some of those things. Like if I wasn't doing this, what would I rather be doing? So we've created this course, but rather than just me kind of, again, going back to my, my cave and building it and then bringing it out to the world and hopefully it's correct, uh, we worked with a, a test group of people. And so we had a, a, a test group of people who all signed up. They paid for it. Uh, for the course. And, and so one of the things I even I told them up front was like, uh, there's no course. You're buying thin air right now. We're going to work together to create something, but I want to make sure we create exactly what it is you need rather than what I think you need. So it's a lot of working with them now so that by the time we are, so they're going through the material right now. Uh, most of the material is done and they're going through it and giving me feedback or making adjustments. But by the time we get ready to do a launch, um, then everybody, then I know that the product that we have is really in line with what people are looking for because we've had people already going through it and it's not something that I just made up on my own but it's something that they helped create they provided input and feedback uh, and I know that by the time we get to the finish line that what we have is exactly what other people are going to be needing and looking for so I think you know some of those lessons from that launch earlier this year that that just didn't work helped me to reshape even how I began creating uh, this new course. So it's, it's, it's made a big difference. I mean, it's such a valid point to come across. I, and I don't care what kind of industry, whether you're service-based, online, whether it's a product, whatever. As an entrepreneur, we kind of get this really biased view. We, we sit inside our bubble, oh, I've got a fantastic idea, I know exactly what it needs to look like, what it's going to feel like, all these kind of things. And it's so easy to lose touch with, we're not actually you know, making something for us, we're making something for our customers. And even if we know our customer base really, really well, that doesn't mean we're going to build a product or a service that aligns completely with them. Yet these right. days, we're so lucky. We have things like Skype, we have things like crowdfunding, we have the ability to set up these subscription models and these separate websites to do exactly what you're doing. Involve a small group of people, you know, beta test it, whether it's 10 people or 20 people or 100 or 200. There's ways to kind of connect and say, hey, I want to involve you from the beginning and right. I'm going to sell it to you at a reduced rate or I'm going to even give it you away for free and I want your feedback and I want you to take ownership of it. And at the end, together, we're going to have this amazing thing that thousands of people are going to enjoy rather than you just like you say, go into your cave, create something you think people are going to love and then send it out there and hear nothing but crickets. Right, right. Yeah, it, it makes it makes a huge difference to kind of walk with people through that process and through that journey. Um, and so it's again, it's not me guessing, but it's the, it's using their words, it's using their language, uh, the, and and what they're saying to communicate uh, and and be able to create exactly what what it is that I know that they need. 
And I mean, from your point of view now, you've obviously got this group of people you're working with in the here and now trying to create an even better product. What are you learning both from an entrepreneur's point of view and what are you seeing from, you know, these ultimately your, your customers, your audience? Are they, are they, do you feel like they're showing more to you because they have this ownership of things? Are they, are they the perfect things in terms of like testimonials and feedback? Are they showing their excitement? Are you seeing a difference in that sense? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a couple thoughts there. Um, one, one of the things that you you mentioned earlier was having people go through it and either uh, allowing them to go through it free or at a discounted rate. So we went with the discounted rate and just saying, hey, it's going to be X when we're finished, but we'll give it to you for this price, and you'll nobody will ever be able to get it at this price except for you. Um, so being able to, whenever they're paying for something, even though in this case when they got when we got started, they're paying for thin air, and we told them that they have uh, they're more invested in it rather than if it's something free. It's like, well, you know, I didn't pay anything. So if I'm if I'm not participating, if I'm not helping, then I'm not losing anything. So I think there's it makes a big difference to have people pay something up front, and uh, that way they they have more buy-in. Um, the other thing, like you kind of said as well, is that by the time we are done with them going through the test material and we get ready to do the actual launch, now we've got a group of people that we have gone through the material and we have testimonials from. I think that's a challenge whenever you're first creating a product. You're like you're putting it out there. But there's no validation of if this works or if this doesn't work. But whenever you've got a, a group of people that I can go back to and all of them have been through the material and they've given feedback and we've tweaked it and they can say, hey, this is how it helped me and this is how I, I gained clarity from this and this is, how my, this is what my job was and this is what it is now. All that stuff uh, really validates the whole product rather than me just telling you that, hey, this is really cool. You should get it. It'll help you. But people who've actually gone through the material, uh, it, it, it brings the, the credibility of it up uh, much, much more than I could say on my own. Oh, yeah. And that credibility and authority, that's such a huge thing in whatever you, you do. And if you've gone through a process with a group of individuals, it's just going to help you because come launch day, you've got, you know, 100 people or whatever to actually who are saying yeah this works and they're yep. going to be really excited to share their feedback because they've kind of got ownership within it no totally and there's been a lot of people who within this kind of test group who've said that of like hey let's do this because i want to make sure it's good for the next group you know yeah. and it's that they they have um it's not like they have a stake in the outcome financially. It's not like they make more or something. They're not, they're not making anything. They paid to be a part of it, but they still feel like it's something that they have ownership of. And they feel like uh, this is something that's able to help other people. And so we want to make sure that it, it's good and it's quality. So, uh, yeah, it's great that they take ownership in something um, that they helped produce, something that they helped create. And I think we're a strange bunch as entrepreneurs because in the beginning, we're always really worried about, you know, letting other people into our process and into our idea because we've, we're worried about it's going to get stolen. But as you sure. kind of go along and, and ultimately have a few failed launches, you start to realize, wow, I shouldn't be worrying about people stealing my ideas. I should just be worried about people giving a damn about my ideas. And the best way to right. have people give a damn is to kind of say, look, you know, be involved in it. Just come help me out. I'm going to take your feedback on board and together we'll turn a good product into a great one. Um, but I think you need to go through a couple of those failures. And once you start, you know, seeing them launches where you think, oh man, I can make 10,000 from this. And actually after two weeks, I've only made like a hundred bucks. You're like, oh, well, I shouldn't be worried about people stealing my idea because I couldn't give this away for free. And after a while, you start thinking, actually, yes, I can involve other people and it's going to produce something far better. Totally. Yeah, totally. It's, um, you know, the, we all just have a limited base of knowledge when it's just based on us. Uh, but whenever we, we work with other people to create something, we're able to, we're able to create a better product, something that's bigger than us. Uh, they're, they're able to point out, um, insights and observations and, uh, they're able to identify my blind spots, things that I would miss that they're, they're able to point out and say, Hey, we, sh we really need to do this. And it's like, wow, I'd, I never thought of that. I didn't think that would help, but I guess if it does, then yeah, let's do that. So um, those things make the finished product much, much better. Yeah, and, and one of the things I always kind of say is that, you know, together I can make something good, but in order to make something great, I need to involve other people. So when I write yeah. a book, I can do a decent job, but I need to involve editors. I need to involve beta readers. I need to involve other people's stories to make something good and to great. And I'm a firm believer that that, you know, applies to pretty much everyone. Um, in all kind of walks of life, you know, we do a pretty good job on our own, but together we are stronger. And I must say, I love the journey that you've taken because it's happened in such a short amount of time. You know, you've been able to, you know, pivot an idea. One course didn't work how you like. So you thought, hey, 
I'm just going to, you know, borrow this. It's fine. You know, I've made a few mistakes, but I've got another launch coming up and I can make sure the next one is even better. And it comes back to our original point of these aren't mistakes so much as just little happenings that we can't dwell on. We can't, you know, cry over this spilled milk. It's just going to make right. my better product. My next situation is tenfold better. So I love that approach. And to just sum things up, you know, there's going to be people out there who are maybe working on a you know, a course, a book, an idea, mm -hmm. a product, a service, whatever. And they might be a little bit worried about letting people in and they might be a bit wary of like how to do it. You've obviously got your podcast. You've got that, you know, space. You know, what mm -hmm. advice would be um, from you to them be regarding, you know, getting people involved? We've talked about giving them a special price. We've talked about making them feel, you know, that ownership and being able to give the testimonies. What other couple bits of pieces would you um, advise them to maybe get that core group and help them, you know, transform something good into great? Yeah, I would say even before you start building something, I think you have to start building the audience. You know, like you said earlier, it's not necessarily that someone's going to steal your idea. It's just getting someone to just care at all, just someone to give a crap about what it is that you're doing. So uh, I think that's that's really, really important to start there. So for me, long before I started building this new course, we started the podcast. And the podcast was a way to just start building the audience, to start hearing from people. Um, because I, it wasn't like um, I was like, hey, let's do this course. Um, so let's do the podcast and then we'll, and we'll just figure out the podcast as we go. It was like, let's do the podcast. Let's figure that out. Let's figure out what people need, what people are listening to, what people are identifying with. Then let's figure out how to create a course based on what they need. Uh, so I think that's really, really important. I think that if you do the course first, you just kind of put the cart before the horse. Um, and you, you're, you're just getting things out of order because again, uh, it's difficult to draw people in and like, Hey, will you pay me money for something that doesn't exist? And they're like, I don't even know who you are, you know, so uh, you don't know anything about me. But, um, you know, for example, I emailed everybody in this test group and I asked them, I said, why did you why did you send all this money to a stranger, me, for something that you know doesn't exist? The product hasn't been made. So why would you do that? Why would you send money? And they all said some variation of we felt like we could trust you because of the podcast. So without doing the podcast, they don't have any idea who I am. But because I've built that relationship and rapport with them through the podcast, then they're much more likely to be like, okay, I feel like I trust this guy. I like this guy. I feel like I know this guy. Therefore, I'm much more likely to send money to him for something that I know doesn't exist. But that doesn't happen unless I do the podcast first. And so for you, whether it's a blog, whether it's a YouTube channel, whether it's a, a podcast, whatever it is that you're just beginning to kind of rally people around some common idea that you have, then you can begin to create something to help those people. But until you know what those people need, it's difficult to create something. Because again, and then it goes back to, I'm just creating what I think other people will need rather than going, no, no, I need to, I need to talk with people. I need to look people in the eye. I want to know from them and in their words what it is that they need help with. Then I can create something that helps that problem rather than creating something that helps my own problem. I think that's really sage advice. And I, it kind of it just goes to show the importance of thinking about that bigger picture if you've got an idea today that you think is going to be a great product well you know it doesn't mean that you can't start creating the product the service you know getting the wheels in motion but as soon as that idea kind of takes fruition just get out there start involving other people hit the forums create a blog a few videos you know do something that will just create a bit of an audience and straight away start asking those opinion involved other individuals because once you do that you'll be able to validate and the longer you leave that it's like you say you just remain in your bubble and you may or may not create something of value and of worth as soon as you get out there and start um you know attacking other people and involving them in the story and say hey you know i want you to check this out i want to hear your feedback the better so i think that's fantastic advice and, in, and indeed this entire conversation has just been brilliant thank you so much grant it's cool been, you know a great journey to show that someone who is very much doing a real world thing in the sense of speaking around schools, a lot of people won't think of that as like, oh, that's the true entrepreneurial journey. You know, that's a you know, that's a brick and mortar type thing where you know you're actually going into real wild places, you're doing something real world, but you've still been able to take that into the online world, start a podcast, and now you're developing these online courses. I think that's fantastic, and the journey and the mistakes you've made, brilliant. Yeah, it's all it's all part of the journey, you know. If 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 I heard this saying the other day, I'd rather make progress than perfection, you know. And if you just wait until you're making until something's perfect, you know. If you if I just waited till uh, everything was perfect before I started a podcast or before you started your podcast uh, or before we do this course, I know 
uh, you know, I, I can be a perfectionist. I want things to go right. I want things to look good. And I know that when this course is done, it's going to be really, really quality. Um, but I know it's not going to be as quality as I would like, but getting it out there and again, continually getting that feedback and continually improving it is the only way that you make any progress other than just sitting here and tinkering and tinkering and tinkering and tinkering and never actually getting it out the door, never actually shipping it. Uh, it's never, then it's never going to see the light of day. So for people that may be watching this or listening to this, whatever that thing is that you're swimming around, just get version one out the door and it may be crap and that's okay. You just start there, start with what you've got and then you can kind of evolve and, and build from there. Let your babies fly, people. I love it. Indeed. I agree completely. Well, Grant, thank you so much for joining me. Indeed, viewer and listener, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you, and it's been an absolute honor to hear your insight and, yeah, have you part of both this podcast and the Success Mistake. Cheers. Good talking to you, man. Cheers, man. And there you go, ladies and gents, another session of the Purple Coffee podcast at, and then a big thanks to you for joining me, and a big thanks to Grant too for being part of this show and the Success of Mistake book. I know that I've taken a lot from his words. It's a great addition to the book and the many, many other stories on offer. And it's something I've come across quite a lot myself. And it's something I've suffered with personally. You have an idea, you're really eager, you just know inside your head that it's right. And that if you just get to work and start doing it, people will buy it, people will love it, people will share it. But without validating, how do you know? It's only your subjective opinion after all. And I think Grant learned a valuable lesson that it's not just about his great ideas, but how he can transfer those great ideas into an actual want that his audience need. And sometimes it's as simple as just asking them a question, getting them to fill out a survey or asking them to actually pre-sell. And when you do so, they will be invested. They will tell you what you they actually want from you and then you can deliver it. So validating your idea is key. It sounds so simple, but it is quite difficult to um, implement at times. So hopefully you've taken something from Grant's wisdom as well as everything else that he offered. So that's basically it. He's definitely a guy you should be following. I hope that you do so. I've left his links as well as all the show notes at tdog.co forward slash purple coffee 53. That's tdog.co forward slash purple coffee 53. And whilst there, please consider subscribing, rating and reviewing this podcast. That would mean an awful lot to moi, but please check out Grant too, because I'm sure that would mean an awful lot to him. So there you go. Thanks for joining me. Have a great one. And until next time, turn dog out. <laughs>